Good afternoon, everybody. A good morning, actually, to ones who are not maybe in Europe, but outside, because I can see people are checking in. The number is rising quickly, actually. And we're expecting even more people now to join any minute. So welcome. Welcome to this first webinar in a series, um, a webinar on data removal for partic practitioners. I'm very happy to see so many people who subscribe to this. I want to learn more about their removal. Um, you will have maybe seen uh, the agenda. We will uh, have another two hours to really go dive into the topic, which is, I think, exciting to all of us. Um, my name is Bart Geenen. I'm with WWF Netherlands. And just to give you a quick, quick uh, introduction about who I am, uh, just to share uh, a couple of thoughts uh if this goes right uh well, hold on uh, yeah uh, i hope you can see this uh entire slide um Something is wrong. wrong. Yes. Yeah, my name is Bart King with WWF Netherlands. And I think they asked me because I was one of the co founders of uh, this European dam removal movement, actually, as we like to call it. And it was a couple of years back that we actually started this discussion with a couple of people. What, what, what do you think about removing dams? And I remember the first time I ever mentioned it, I think the, way the, the reactions were mixed. One said, um, this is a crazy idea and the others were absolutely over the moon. I thought it was the best idea ever. And I still think that's where we are today. Uh, we are people who are really enthusiastic about the removal of dams. And I think therefore for me, you know, dam removal is all about people. It's all about people who all share the same passion and actually think that uh, a fantastic idea would be to look into the possibilities of removing dams across Europe and restore some of our rivers and to really start enjoying them once again. Um, today we'll hear many more people talking about the techniques and the technicalities and how do you go about it and share experiences and lessons. I'm very, very much looking forward to that. Um, uh, well, I think that's also the way we can try to get people really on board of how we do things and learn from each other. Um, this is a webinar in which um, where, um, I would ask you, uh, to uh, be in listening mode. Um, you can't um, uh, really dive into uh, the discussion itself, but I want to invite you uh, to put your questions down in the box below on the questions and answers. Uh, you can also, of course, chat with each other uh, because I think that the experience is also to, to, to get to know each other, to try to understand what is actually happening. And maybe also after this, I do hope that we will meet uh, on all kinds of bases and platforms again, but also individually. Um, we will be doing something very exciting today. Uh, we will be removing a dam in Sweden. And uh, I want to ask actually um, how things are going and uh, I want to introduce Asa Fallon. He is um, from the NGO of Erdane and uh, he's actually in Sweden as we speak. And I want to ask him actually, Asa, how are things going in Sweden? Bus, you need to unmute. Bus. Okay, well. Do we have sound from Sweden? Yes, you are in Asia. How are you doing? And I'm, how's the weather I'm, in Sweden? I'm just fine and the weather is partly cloudy and we like that because we have had such a heat for a couple of weeks now. I'm standing in the middle of the damn removal. You can hear the sound from the machines behind me. I will take you down there just in a minute. Where you are? When, how does it look behind you? Well, let's take a little walk down here and, and 
see what's going on because you are at the moment live from Mariaberg, uh, Sweden, and this is the last moment of the removal of Mariaberg Harbor Power Station. Behind me, you can see the machines are working. Uh, and probably hear them too. I can hear them very well, Asa. Um, uh, and it, it seems very exciting. Can you maybe tell the, um, the people and the audience what happened so far? How is it possible that you got to this stage today? And we are, um, what happened so far? Yeah, okay. Uh, I have a bit of difficulty to hear you. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, this project has been possible thanks to cooperation between several uh, companies here in Sweden and funded by a couple of EU projects. Uh, the work has been progressed for a week or two and the removal should be done in more than one week. Still more than one week. Right. I understand that uh, is, uh, it has been a, a hydropower dam for, for, for 100 years or so, right? So yes, this is yes. you know, a hydropower station in an existing system for a long time. And um, what, what is so special about today? Oh, I didn't put, quite get the last. Could you please repeat? I said, uh, Geza, this has been a hydropower dam in um, use for over 100 years, more or less. So there's quite an old dam. And um, so uh, how exciting is today actually? It, it, it is a great day, it is a great day. I can tell you that if you look down behind the machine, you see the water. And, and yesterday, Frederick, you will talk to him later, he, he filmed around 10 salmon uh, on the way up, uh, more or less around 10 kilos each. And, and the fish, they, they like this dam removal because they will get free passage uh, up to the river. Excellent. So it's a great day for us, for the fish and the biodiversity. Ada, we are very happy that you are on site. We will talk to you later today. Um, so let's let's first um, go to our first uh, speaker to tell us a little bit more about uh, the history of dam removal. So I'll get to back to you, Asa, uh, later on today. Thank you very much so far. Bye bye. Um, our first speaker is Pao. Pao is uh, based in Spain. I know her for quite a long time, and she is a very passionate river lover. Uh, and, uh, is that correct, uh, Pao? And why? Why are you so in love with rivers? <laughs> well, uh, I I have always thought that rivers are the veins, like our veins. So uh, they connect everything, and uh, I think they are crucial if we want to keep a healthy planet and keep us healthy, I think it's crucial that they are healthy too. Right, good. Hey, um, for everybody, again, uh, who just uh, logged in, um, we will have a number of speakers and I want really to give you any opportunity to ask questions, uh, but please do that in the chat box. Uh, there's a chat box below. Uh, please feel free to chat with each other in the chat. And later on, according to the agenda, we will get back to you on questions and answers and we'll dive into a couple of them. So please do. And meanwhile, Pao, you will tell us a little bit yeah. more about their removal in Europe. Yeah. How did that happen? And what are your ideas on how to scale it up? Over yes. to you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you very much. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So. So yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so today I would like to uh, briefly share with you a summary about how dam removal started it and what has been achieved since we officially started it in 2016, in November, in our first uh, dam removal Europe International Seminar in Leon, Spain. So um, who is behind dam removal Europe? Well, it's a partnership between seven organizations so it's WWF, uh, European Rivers Network, the River Trust, Rewilding Europe, the Nature Conservancy, Wetland International, and the organization I work for, World Fish Migration Foundation, which was created in 2014 to save migratory fish 
by reconnecting rivers because we don't like seeing fish banging their head on barriers. So uh, how did it start? Well, it was 2012, uh, right after taking a short course on dam removal, which uh, is where I met Lara Wildman. She was one of the teachers in the course. And uh, I met Herman Vanningen, our future founder of the foundation, uh, during the Peace Passage Conference in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts. And in that trip, in the trip back home, Herman and I were discussing uh, how in shock we were on all the information, all the knowledge, all the cases and studies that were happening in USA on dam removal. And we were like sitting down, looking to each other and saying, what the hell is happening in Europe? I mean, we, we know nothing. There is uh, nothing being published or we barely hear or read anything about it. So that's when Herman asked me if I would like to participate uh, on the start on the removal movement. And uh, well, I almost faint, but of course I didn't tell him until like three years later, <laughs> but I was like, really? So right when we arrived home, we started at, um, searching country by country, what was going on, and we were in shock. I mean, we were like, nobody's talking about this and these amazing achievements, look the numbers, and what is happening, what's the before and after. So what we decided was cre first creating a website where we collected all this information, cases, studies, you know, all kind of information we found, like uh, uh, references, we have over 100 references, scientific papers, articles, manuals, books, thesis, which by the way, we need to add two, uh, two more new thesis. We created the first uh, removal policy report, which uh, we took actually to the European Commission last year, and you are welcome to download it from our website. We started at, um, organizing national seminars and international seminars we have created uh, up to now five international seminars, but we don't only share information there and experience on European, about uh, the cases in European countries. Also around the world, we had cases from USA, from China, from Canada, from uh, possible cases in South Korea. And we created, along these three years and a half, we created a network of over 1,200 people and experts, which is, amazing. And for example, WWF created a crowdfunding campaign to help uh, fund dam removals. And in only two years, it has crowdfunded 15 dam removals, thanks to 1,899 funders from 18 countries. And for me, one of the most special things is that the first dam removal ever done in Lithuania is going to happen this month in July, thanks to this crowdfunding campaign. But uh, a very important thing that I would like to highlight is media. We have now created a community uh, that where media can go and get correct and accurate information. This is crucial. This didn't happen before. So what it seems that happened before that these kind of projects were done by a few fish freaks that, you know, wanted to just flow down and that's it and really didn't show serious information sometimes. But now the media uh, knows that this is very serious uh, project and there's a huge expert community behind all this information. And actually, thanks to Amber project, which is a Horizon 2020 project, now we know that there is a lot of work to do. Nobody knew these figures you were seeing until last year when Amber started talking about them. And now we know that we have the most fragmented rivers in the world. So it's the moment to act now. I mean, the numbers are breathtaking and we need to start doing something about it. And actually it's the moment. We now know that the water framework directive, which finally won't be modified, is gonna help a lot. And the support of some strategies like the biodiversity strategy of 2030 that was published in last May, which wants to restore over 25,000 kilometers is a fantastic start. Just Amazing, but as I say, it's a start because we really need the support from national funds to really make this a step further and to make it happen. And actually it's happening in some countries. I wanna highlight that countries like Finland, 
France, Scotland, they do already have these national funds to cover the cost and help fund this project. But I want to make something very clear for everybody. I don't want people to think that that removal is only about putting money and expenses and you know spending money and having it like a great expense, not at all, not at all. Because now we know that dam removals are not only, uh, it's not only environmental and, and safety benefits, it's also about economic benefits. And we know this because it's not only, it does not only create new business like recreational activities, reopening fisheries, like this case that you can see here in the Kennebec River in Maine, which the city now gets $20,000 a year because of taxes, because they reopened the fisheries of shads thanks to these two lockdown removals, is not only about that. For example, the, some studies that have been done by the Division of Ecological Restoration from the Massachusetts uh, state government shows and proves that river restoration projects like dam removal creates and generates equal or greater economic inputs than road or bridge construction. This is crucial for everybody to remember. This is very important. And I'm very happy to see some countries like Lithuania after our national seminars, they are analyzing in this moment the best ways to implement dam removals in their regulations. For me, personally, this is, for me, was the best news of 2020. This is happening nationally, finally, thanks to Dam Removal Europe. And now, before ending this very short and brief um, uh, summary, I, we really wanted to, um, to have with us a person from American Rivers, the president of American Rivers, Bob Irving because they started removing dams earlier than us and they really know what it means dam removal. So Bob, I don't know if you are around. Are you there? I'm here. I am, Paul. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. So on behalf of American Rivers, I just want to say uh, how pleased we are to be part of this and to be here to, to help celebrate today's dam removal and the growing dam removal movement all across Europe. And I, I wanna say a special thanks to the World Fish Migration Foundation, to Herman and Bao and Ewan for their leadership in promoting dam removal and river restoration in Europe and around the world. Two years ago, when I had the good fortune to travel to Helsinki for World Fish Migration Day, my friend Samsa Vilhonen at w, WF Finland uh, took me afterwards to a very special place, a rapid named Lasakoski to fish for brown trout. And when I was there, of course, they, I got a hat. And on the hat, you'll see it says Lasakoski since 1557. And I asked what the significance of the date was. And I was amazed to learn that this rapid that we were fishing had been protected for the fish for more than 450 years, since 1557 when it was part of Sweden and Swedish King Gustav I decreed its preservation. So the roots of river conservation run deep throughout Europe. And today you are putting down new roots of river restoration, which are spreading across Europe and around the globe. In the US, our dam removal movement is just over 20 years ago. As Powell mentioned, the Edwards Dam on the Kennebec River in the state of Maine was re removed in 1990 to restore that river for Atlantic salmon, shad, and herring. And since then, we have removed more than 1,200 dams in the United States. We've gone from a nation that built dams on every river to one that is removing dams to restore rivers for fish and people. And I am so pleased to see this movement growing, not only in the United States, but in Europe and around the world. With every dam removed, a river is restored for the fish, for the people, for today's generations, and for generations to come. And so today, as we celebrate this dam removal, I think back to the fact that nearly 500 years ago, Sweden's king had the foresight to protect Lasakoski Rapid for the fish. And it is my hope that 500 years from now, future generations will remember that we had the foresight in Sweden, in Europe, and around the world to remove dams and to restore them for fish, to restore the rivers for fish and for people. 
So thank you very much for allowing me to join in today's celebration and congratulations. What a great day it is. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Thank you so, so much. This was a very special message. Thank you. So this is it. This is my very brief uh, um, summary of what uh, that removal Europe and what has achieved in these past three years and a half. So let's do it. Let's continue and let it flow. Thank you, Bart. Thank you very much, Paul. It was a pleasure. And also the honor, Bob, that you are here on the, this call. Um, and actually, Paul, you are demonstrating that we, it's about connecting rivers, it's about connecting people, right? It's all about getting people very excited about something new and something exciting. And I think that's, that's demonstrated also by today, we are linking up people actually across the world. Um, thanks a lot. And, um, with that, I would like to jump to the UK, actually, and then to jump to, to Jack. Uh, Jack, um, uh, you are uh, heading the Ribble River Trust, and um, you'll take us a little bit through uh, your experiences in the UK. But first of all, what is the River Trust, actually? Uh, well, we're a registered charity whose sort of core objective is to, to restore, improve and protect um, rivers, but particularly the whole catchment and not just focusing on the channel, the, the whole river system. Exactly. And I, I, what's nice about it actually, I think, is that you, uh, you, you, you involve people actually who live there and who live along the basins and live along the rivers. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're very much a grassroots organization. Uh, myself, I live in the center of our catchment and you know, we work with the local people trying to encourage them to get involved. And you know, that, that might be from tackling invasive species, but uh, one of our weir removals, one of our smaller ones that was crowdfunded uh, by, by uh, the World Fish Migration and WWF, uh, that was involving volunteers. We had one guy uh, who was an employee with a chainsaw, the rest was volunteers and crowbars. It was, it was uh, really nice to get people involved. That's engagement, great. People, we are more than 400 already, so uh, that's great. And welcome again, everybody who just joined. And um, again, please, you know, Put forward your questions because you can't ask you know, questions during the presentations. Ask questions about anything you hear or anything that pops up. Put it on the questions and answers tab that uh, you see below. And also please like questions. If you think this is a fantastic questions, please like them. So later on in the questions and answers, we can try to pick out those that uh, you all find uh, most interesting. So please do. And Jack, uh, please take us uh, through uh, your experiences so far. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, yeah, so as Bart mentioned, I'm the uh, Chief Executive of Ribble Rivers Trust, and uh, I just want to give you some lessons learned from my life's ambition to, to demolish as many uh, barriers on the Ribble as possible and rebuild the Ribble. Um, I'd like to give you a bit of geographic content, so that's the map of the UK excluding Northern Ireland. Um, and that tiny little red area there is our catchment, so relatively speaking it's quite small. Uh, it's uh, 1,950 square kilometres um, and this map sort of shows a bit uh, of the sort of extent of urban areas and the grey the grey boxes. It starts in the Yorkshire Dales uh, which is a sort of quite high altitude within the UK, very steep gradient systems and it flows out to the northwest coast or the Fylde coast where maybe uh, its appearance uh, is more familiar to people from the Netherlands than maybe uh, you would think of the northwest of England. It's got a real mixture of characteristics, um, as with many uh, catchments in the UK. But something that surprises a lot of people is our population. So there are 1.25 million people living in this catchment, uh, and a lot of those are concentrated. But we already have 1,000, nearly 1,100 uh, recorded artificial barriers. Uh, and that's what it looks like when we plot it on a, a map of the catchment. So we, we have a real problem. We're fortunate to uh, be home to many iconic species. So we have three species of lamprey, we have many salmonids, shad, but some of the kind of lesser uh, regarded species, but quite um, important to the childhood of, uh, of many people in the UK who grew up around rivers, uh, gudgeon and, and what we call miller's thumb. But they're all impacted by dams. Um, and you now, as I mentioned, we've got a huge number. They come in all shapes and sizes. Um, but predominantly they were for the purpose of providing water power to the mills that were associated to the industrial uh, revolution. Uh, our part of the world was one of the most affluent uh, uh, parts of the world during the industrial revolution. 
Um, but we also have 28 reservoir dams, so bigger uh, dams, uh, and those are for drinking water provision, but also for canals, because canals were really important for transporting goods. Now, I'd like to talk to you then about some of the lessons. We've been removing dams for uh, about 12 years. Um, and we started out with um, very little learning, a little bit of guidance from uh, people uh, across the country. But one question that was sort of regularly asked, what is a, what is a barrier and what is uh, a barrier, uh, what is it a barrier to? So um, many people start to think about just removing pieces of the barrier to allow their particular species to get through. So you might not remove all of this structure to allow salmonid migration. But we very rapidly adopted a, a sort of a phrase, which was all species, all ages, all times in both directions and sediments too. And the really interesting thing when you start to think about sediments is that the better the transport of sediment, the more natural the process is, the better the passage of fish. So in this instance, um, we were able to remove uh, almost all of the structure. We had to build an alternative river crossing. But really what I want to highlight here is that lovely gravel sediment that's deposited, which means that we've had reduced stream power, which means lower velocities, which means almost every species of fish will be able to migrate through the structure. Where they previously couldn't. This is one of our uh, more challenging and harder lessons learned and I'm, I'm very much a believer in uh, learning uh, by doing but also um, in sharing when you've got things wrong because often it's really easy to, to promote where we get things right and people don't always take away as much from that. So this, uh, this dam had a fish pass on it, um, if that's what you want to call it, to the right of this photo. And that was actually the second fish pass constructed. Initially, we contemplated just making a better fish pass because it was quite a constrained location. You can see the houses in the background and the garden bridge. Um, but it was redundant. It had no purpose. So we thought, well, we'll remove it. And so after six months of preparation, we went to site. We were very fortunate. We went into a drought, so we had low water conditions, which meant we removed the dam very, very quickly. And then we left site. And the day we left site, the rain began and we had flooding that summer uh, in the UK. And we learned a very hard lesson. So the sudden removal of the dam with no sort of response from the river meant that the, there was a sudden massive uh, transport of sediment both from the river bed and the river bank from upstream where it had been impounded by the dam downstream. And the garden configuration allowed that gravel to be deposited entirely in the river channel, which is to the left of this photo where you can see the gravel. And so the water moved. We were within maybe uh, 25 millimeters of flooding this house. And I can tell you now, I did not sleep very well for three weeks while the rain kept coming and kept coming and we tried to figure out the solution. But we did figure out the solution and that was to adjust the garden to allow more natural um, movement of the, the gravel. So we worked with the river to solve this problem. And I think what, when we look back, what we realized is if we'd removed the, the dam more slowly, allowing uh, uh, removing a piece and allowing the river to, to move some of the sediment, we could have done a more responsive uh, project rather than deal with a lot of headaches after after the main piece of work was completed. Um, this was um, another dam where we experienced um, erosion issues. We're not entirely certain that, that they were our fault, but there were things that we could have done better. So uh, our dam had been removed in partnership uh, downstream, and we now had salmon uh, migrating for the first time in over 200 years to this location. And uh, this weir was the, the, next, the next on the hit list. Um, and we were very conscious of the depth of the scour pool. So we, uh, when we removed the weir, we removed it such that we put the um, stones from the weir into the scour pool downstream to prevent uh, a nick point formation. And because it was a very erodible bed, we didn't want that nick point to move upstream and cause uh, bank subsidence and, and land subsidence. Well, one um, more minute, sir, Jack. Sorry? One more minute. Yeah, and so we uh, removed we removed the weir, and uh, it took 24 hours uh, to remove the weir. A couple of years on, we saw the the gravel migration downstream, which was doing really well. Um, but we had uh, a, pro a phone call from the farmer where he felt that we had caused uh, a lot of the uh, erosion upstream. So. Uh, 
what we should have done is looked at historic maps uh, to understand how the river was behaving. We're not sure it was our fault, but we would have been able to foresee this problem if, uh, if we'd looked at the historic maps. But we worked with the farmer and got a better solution. This one was very unpopular with the, the public because it was seen as a natural feature and we had to grow a really thick skin. Uh, and, and that's really important when removing dams. We're not going to please everybody. And finally, you've got to break a, 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 some eggs to make an omelette. But what we learned in this location was that contractors really need to have experience in working in rivers. Rivers are hostile environments for human beings. They're not good places to be trying to work. We can't control things. And so here, where they incorrectly uh, installed the temporary works, we, were, uh, we, we saw this sediment release at a sensitive time of year that maybe could have been avoided if the uh, contractor had more experience. How to gain experience, start with a small weir and allow them to build up. So just in very quick summary, take out as much of the, the dam as possible uh, for as much benefit for fish and sediments. Consider gradual removal so that you can do responsive uh, uh, removal as you go along. Um, check out old maps, use uh, record centers, online resources. You can find out a lot of unknown uh, factors from them. Um, do right by the river uh, and you are doing it right. So make sure that you have belief in the, uh, in the evidence that you're doing the right thing from the river. Uh, and finally, use contractors that are experienced and where you can give them experience in smaller projects first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. This was extremely helpful. And I think it's so important to acknowledge that uh, things don't always go as planned. And these lessons are crucial. So. Thanks a lot, and I guess that this will raise questions for people and again in this call. Please feel free to put your questions forward, and I will probably get back to Jack maybe later on during the questions and answers sessions. But uh, thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jack. Great. Um, the great thing is about this this virtual meeting, you can just swap from one country to the other, no problem whatsoever. So let's go to France and let's go to Stefan. Stefan, welcome. Um, and I understand you're one of the very few or the only one um, water, um, water engineering club or authority in France that is actually removing dams. How, how is that? Welcome everybody. So I will try to give you the, the, the wish to come to France to see what uh, we did. I want uh, firstly also to apologize because I'm not speaking as fluently as uh, Jack uh, before me. So let's, uh, let's come in France and let's tie some feedbacks from the field. So uh, I'm Stéphane on the left side on the picture and uh, my colleague uh, Jean-Luc and I are working for Science 2010 on the dam removal subjects. In our water basin, water agency, um, whose office is located in Douai, but the main terms you can know are uh, Lille and Amiens. So if you don't know what to do for holidays, I give you some uh, ideas of Lille, known for its annual flea market, or Amiens with uh, the 800th birthday of its cathedral, Notre Dame. We will talk about this cathedral further because we have the dam removal works here. So if uh, there are traffic jams there, you will know it's uh, our fault. So a water agency, a water basin, works on the polluter pays principle. And we have about, for the next six years, about 1 billion euros forecast to help local authorities to lead projects on improving water quality and restoring rivers uh, within the water framework. We have two main rivers in our basin called the Viesco and Vimeuse. But uh, our uh, river is uh, mostly on the coastal and western part of our basin, the Little Star, as the dam removals I will show you further. The stakes for our basin are on salmonids, salmon, seed shads, but also lampreys, and mainly uh, eels and glass eels in our basin. Our rivers are very fragmented, with about one dam per two kilometers of rivers. Most of them are old and obsolete, and uh, less than two meters high. This is a picture of uh, a typical dam of uh, our basin. 
Most of them also, since uh, Napoleon, are private, as you can see on this picture. So when we are walking on dams, we have to cope with uh, the neighborhood of the dams, with all the owners involved in the project, but also all the farmers who can uh, have the crops in the, in the neighborhood of the project. So one solution for the practitioner is to buy the dam. In this example, in this photo, in this picture, uh, we have the opportunity to buy the dams and to bypass them to meander again the river. You can see further uh, information, have further information of, on this project, uh, thanks to the French uh, Office of Biodiversity, which has a collection of some examples. And I give you in the slide the YouTube links to uh, uh, learn uh, more about uh, this project. So in some cases, we buy the dam. In other cases, we are invested in the works by the dam owner. So at each, at each step, we have a public market to study and find the best solution and also to lead, finally, the works. It could uh, take a long time before we lead the works, sometimes more than 10 years to uh, finally lead the works. Sometimes it's easy with a jib uh, uh, crane, you have one day works, but before you have to build up a technical and administrative file on some benefits before leading the works, uh, as in, in this case. And you have to cope with adverse uh, position as cultural heritage, duck pond, wetlands, wedding pitcher, sound of the waterfall, floats, and also because we are often in the garden of the owner. So you have to cope with this before leading the works. So some examples of cultural heritage. We have a lot of old mills, as on this picture. Here we keep uh, the paddle wheels, remove the dams, and restore fish migration way through a roof block stone ramp, as on this picture. So we can cope the two targets, keeping cultural heritage and allowing fish to go upstream for uh, spawning. I told you uh, about Amiens and it's uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, older than one of uh, Paris. But uh, in this case, you can see the Saint Michel Factories Dam here on the Somme River. Firstly, we wanted to remove totally and fully this uh, dam. It was not possible due to the cultural heritage. So the project was to restore fish migration of salmon and seafood and eels through these dams. But uh, nevertheless, we have to keep the building here and only remove the dam on the lower west of the river. So it's a result here. The speed was too quick, so we put a roof block stone through this building to restore fish migration. Furthermore, we have a little stream upper, up to a lock uh, gate uh, navigation dam with already a fish ladder. We have to go through this, uh, this uh, little stream, which was too, too speed, and we have to keep uh, this, uh, this uh, lime trees always due to cultural heritage. It's a uh, little bit uh, costly. Uh, due to these uh, trees. And we have not enough uh, wife uh, to develop bioengineering bio techniques as we did in other, in other works. In this case, it's uh, an old mill dam that uh, we removed. In this case, we have a urge downstream pumping plant. On, during these works, uh, no suspended matter at all was permitted. So we use some technique, uh, straw filters or geotextiles, and we derivate the river to have a temporary riverbed to work easily. But this problematic of uh, suspended matters was the most uh, thing to cope with during the works. This is before the, the works, and this is after the works. In each uh, works, in each uh, dam removal, we have to cope with uh, the spread of uh, exotic species during the works. So this is some, example, some examples uh, of how we manage to, to uh, avoid them during our works. Most of uh, the solution we use 
uh, is uh, bioengineering techniques on river banks with planting uh, trees and grasses and putting fences uh, among the, the river banks. Well, one last minute, uh, Stefan. Yeah, so uh, for, to, for this project, uh, you see the dam after, before and after. To prevent uh, upstream and downstream erosion, uh, we use the remains of the old dams to fill in the riverbed. And also, uh, we add some gravels when uh, it's uh, necessary to restore the natural slope of the river and avoid uh, erosion. During the walks, we have to cope sometimes with delinquency damages, as you can see on this picture, with a jeep crane which was burnt during the walks. And sometimes it's difficult to access to the dam due to the crossing of grosses or due to the, um, the garden of the owner which you have to cross. So it's a factor of cost. Then uh, the walks are finished. It's not totally finished for us because we have to cope uh, with the efficiency control as the rivers can move during the flood. As you can see on this photo, the water policy check always at each step that our works allow fish migration. In this case, we bypass the dams. After a flood, we have to correct the riverbed to, uh, to uh, improve uh, fish migration and river restoration works. Sometimes the banks collapsed and we have also with a bioengineering techniques to correct it, as you can see on this picture. So to, to conclude, I, I will say restoration needs to maintain the river also in good condition a long time after, ago after the works, as you can see on the picture, you have to, to uh, forecast it. And uh, dam removal is always the best solution for the hydromorphology of the river and the restoration of rivers, running rivers. It's sometimes difficult, you have to reach compromise, but uh, uh, it's the best and the most efficient uh, solution for river morphology. To conclude, I would say we have the blue square in the basin are ours, but there are many other dam removers in our basin. And I would like to thank all the network of local authorities and partners involved in all its uh, projects. So thank you for your attention, everybody. Thank you very much, Stefan. That was very interesting. Um, and thanks for sharing um, all the lessons learned. But it's also good to see that there are so many more dams uh, still plant to remove. So please keep us posted, right? And please us, uh, keep, keep, us, uh, keep us in the loop. Ruben, uh, let's, let's um, move to questions. I do see that um, a lot of questions are popping up. And to help us guide through the questions, I want to ask Ruben. Ruben, you, you are an ecologist and you work for the Leipzig in, um, Institute for Freshwater Ecology in Berlin. Uh, why are you so interested in, uh, in dam removals? So uh, you caught me off guard here, but thank you. Uh, I am very interested in dam removal. Um, I'm a fish ecologist, so uh, migratory species are obviously a big uh, chunk of my daily work life. And I'm also uh, privately um, interested in the well-being of, of these fish, particularly these fish, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm involved in Dam Removal Europe and the World Fish Migration Foundation in general. Um, I study uh, hydropower uh, effects on fish populations and we all know that hydropower plants uh, have the biggest effects mainly on migratory species and right. I'm trying to uh, quantify what it actually does to populations. Great. So what are the, what are the questions that uh, you are seeing, uh, Ruben? And can you pick so, a couple of them? Yes, we have a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we can't answer all of them. We just don't have the time for it. Just let me look at my second screen here. Um, apologies for not looking directly at you guys. Uh, so people have prioritized a few and I am just uh, going through them. There's uh, one um, uh, asked by a person uh, with the acronym of ABT. Um, and please, if you ask questions, make sure that you specify whom you're actually asking, because uh, we have had four presentations. We can't, um, we can't always uh, t tie them to the, 
to the presenters, but I'll ask them anyway. So I think this is for Bob. Um, and the question is, do you have the knowledge of percentage between, between private, privately owned dams that have been removed and publicly owned dams? Is it something that Bob could answer, please? Um, I don't have, have that uh, statistic in front of me. I know in, in the US, it's a mix. And often we, we have the same problem that, uh, that some of the other speakers have identified, which is figuring out who actually owns the dam and who is responsible for it. Uh, but, but often it's, it is a, a mix uh, of, of dams and the engagement is often with either the, our federal government or with one of our state governments in removing a dam. Thank you very much. I hope that clarified it. Uh, the second one that got upvotes is uh, asked by J-H-S-E-S-K-E-T-H. Uh, the question is, hello, do you see much land subsidence, subsidence and movement due to drawdown of the water level in the land surrounding the dams? If so, how do you mitigate against this? We are looking at removing some weirs which are much smaller than dams. But we have seen land movement and cracking, which has put uh, people off moving forward with their wear removals. That's actually a very, very meaningful, interesting question. Thank, a question. Thank you for asking that. I'm not sure who this is for. Uh, I would assume it could be Jack. Um, it also fits Stefan. Uh, so um, every, anyone who feels particularly addressed by that question, please speak up. I'm, I'm happy to have a first go. Um, uh, in one of the examples I uh, gave, that was the, one of the potential causes. Uh, so uh, the nick point formation is generally what we're looking for. So if there's a risk of uh, the, there being a sudden gradient change and the bed is mobile, then there is a risk of bank subsidence where the riverbed drops and essentially you, you get that slippage in. You can mitigate for that by infilling the scour hole, um, but often you just need to look upstream and look at old historic maps to look at what the risk is. Uh, sometimes you can just reprofile the riverbanks upstream. Um, it, it, you need to look at each site in consideration, but that is one of the key considerations, especially if you've got constraints like houses um, or factories or mills. Um, but you know, there's a, a lot of processes that can be put in place to pre prevent that subsidence. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, ask you a follow-up by Rudy. Uh, he asks, are the dams in the river catchment still in use? How many percentages are obsolete and how do you identify the ones to be removed first? Very interesting questions. Well, um, yeah, it's 98% um, of them are redundant. Uh, I would say maybe that might creep up uh, or go down a bit to 90%. Um, but the vast majority are 100 or so years old and, and do uh, have no purpose anymore. Um, in terms of prioritizing, it's about being strategically opportunistic. So we've done GIS mapping to identify uh, most habitat area connected. Um, and then we do it by, um, we take that data and include uh, species important proximity to the sea. And then we try to tie up with funding opportunities. So. Uh, there might be funding specifically for eels, in which case we might be targeting lower down the, the, the system dams. If it's trout, we may be looking further up. So we're using GIS uh, tools to, to help prioritize. Thanks, very comprehensive. Uh, I just hear that apparently it sounds like somebody's typing in my background. It's deadly quiet here. I don't know who it is. Well, it's not me. Is that yeah, um, yeah I, I think uh, for that session, we are almost done. I, there's one thing I would like to mention right now um, as the last thing for the session. So this is a World Fish Migration Day event. Um, maybe you are aware of it, but the World Fish Migration event, as it usually happens, and it, as it should have happened this uh, year on May 16th, had, had to have... Um, were postponed due to obvious reasons. And now it's happening on the 24th of uh, October. And I would uh, like you all to um, upload your event on the, on the website and um, yeah, and make it uh, and, and be part of that global movement. Um, so this is one example of how an event could look like. And we are very happy that we can have it here in an international setting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruben. And we'll get back to you later.
Uh, the next block will uh, more be about Sweden and particularly and uh, so but please do everybody we have exactly 451 participants so please keep on uh, putting your questions and keep on chatting um, I think there's a very um, important thing to do um, Asa I'm wondering what is happening in Sweden how are you doing and then um, um, how's the dam doing Asa we are now seeing where is is more or less. So he is there in the south of Sweden. We are zooming in. There is the dam. I can't see Isa yet. Uh, did you see Asa. me waving? Hello. Did you see me waving? We can see you. We can see. You. Uh, sorry, Great. and and uh, welcome back to Sweden, guys. Uh, sorry about the first uh, appearance. We we had a little bit too much machines going on at the moment, and. and uh, they are quite noisy around here. Uh, we, we have just moved down a little bit away from the noise. You could probably hear it in the background. And the guys are doing a terrific job to, to get down the last parts of the hydropower plant. <clears throat> oh, great. So well, for, for this next. Thanks, Eza. So I understand, Eza, you have Ola with you. From yeah. the Klausberg University, um, yeah, maybe maybe great uh, that you could uh, you could introduce him. Yeah, I have Ole in front of me, and I will be with you guys. But I will do the silly thing with my finger and change the camera. I hope. Okay, and now <laughs> you got great. Mr. Ole Kalles in picture. Let's move a little bit closer so he. He, he is uh, quite nervous, actually, he told me. <laughs> Hello, Ole. You, hey. you are a researcher from Karlstad University. You have been involved with, with this uh, project here in Maria Bay. Could you please give us a little bit more of introduction of who you are and what are your connections to this project? I'll, I couldn't really catch everything as I said now, but I'll, I'll do my best. So I'm Ole Kallis. I'm a researcher at Karlstad University, and I work mostly with fish migration, fish passage, and, and uh, solutions for fish passage. And um, when it comes to river restoration in, in Sweden, we have done what most other countries have done in the past, uh, which has been to focus on large salmonid fish. So to provide upstream passage for large salmon and trout, basically. Um, but since about 25 years, that has gradually shifted away from technical fishways targeting salmonids, so denial fishways, pool and wear fishways, and so on, to nature-like fishways. Uh, and along with that, of course, there's been um, a shift of target species from salmonids that I mentioned just, just now to, well, pretty much all naturally occurring fish species and um, different life stages as well. And I guess I will refer to a lot of years, how many years ago and so on. Yeah, okay. So about the dam re removal as a solution to increase fish migration here in Sweden, could you please rate that? Uh, how, how common is it to, to uh, uh, remove dams? Right, so I, I just mentioned that we might work mostly on passage, so both upstream passage and downstream passage and uh, quite a lot of habitat restoration. So dam removal as a river restoration tool is quite new. And so when I heard the first talk about it some years ago, um, I never thought it would happen in Sweden because uh, we re rely heavily on hydropower for electricity production. We get like 40 to 50% of our electricity from hydropower. So, uh, but now here we are, it's happening. I would still say that it's not very common. It's not the first hydropower plant being removed. Um, but in the past, we have removed quite a lot of barriers to migration. So when dam removal did their first overview of a couple of countries and the number of dams removed in each country, I think Pau showed this um, a version of this overview uh, in a presentation. Then we saw that Sweden was one of the most well, successful, if you like, countries when it came to dam removal, which I didn't believe in. As it turned out, it was a matter of definition. 
uh, we have removed a lot of barriers, but not dams. So a lot of small structures. Okay, and about the removal, uh, how would you say, is it typically that they are forced upon the owners or do they do it and have to pay for it themselves? Okay, um, as far as I know, all removals of uh, hydropower plants and, and major dams have been voluntary. So maybe the initiative didn't always come from the owner, but they uh, did not object to it. So it's been voluntary and it's always been a matter of co-funding. So a bit of funding from the owner, of course, but then the rest came from diverse funding, EU funding, national funding, quite a bit of green electricity funding. So the Nature Conservancy in Sweden uh, in collaboration with the hydropower industry. So voluntary and uh, co-funded. Okay, thank you. And if you, you look at the future, near and, and a bit far away, how, how, what about dam removals? <laughs> so, in, sorry. What about dam removals in the future? Will they increase? Well, that's, that's a million dollar question. Uh, I'm uh, positive that we will see removals also in the future, but the numbers, I, I don't know. But what I do know is that we at last got the new legislation formally approved last week. Um, and the implication of that is that we will, um, all hydropower plants in Sweden will have to be relicensed uh, during the next 20 to 30 years. So in the past, they had eternal um, permits and uh, they were also under the old water law, which is in fact exactly as old as this hydropower plant, so 1918. So um, there will be a lot of restoration actions in our regulated rivers in the years to come. And I would guess some removals as well. Yeah, okay. And how do you, what's your opinion about our expert skills needed for a bigger scale removal of dams in Sweden? Well, that's a tricky one. I mean, we have a lot of contractors with experience from large restoration projects and also designing and implementing fishway, fishways, fish passage solutions. So I would guess that uh, removing a dam is not that much, much different from those projects, but I mean, we have competent people around. We have contractors around, so I guess we should pass that question on to them. Yeah, and as a last question, Tell, tell me a bit about your feelings about, of, of this project, the, the, the removal of Maria Bay. How do you feel about it? Well, I think it's amazing. I mean, it's been uh, planned for quite some years. So we've been waiting and waiting, and waiting for the actual removal to happen. So uh, we're super excited and it's, it's definitely good news for fish. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, one more question, could, could you, Fill us in a little bit more of, of uh, your role at this project. Right. So, um, well, I'm a biologist. So my task here is to evaluate the effects of removal. Um, so um, we will focus on fish. We're looking mostly at fish passage, uh, fish migration, before and after the removals. And the study species will mainly be salmon uh, in combination with eels probably. So the, the idea behind that is that eels and salmon are very different. So if we see good results with those spe both species, uh, we would also uh, take for granted that it's also functional for other species. So we will look at that. We will also look at, of course, reproduction and uh, production of uh, uh, young fish. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ole. And um, I have one last question. Uh, you are now looking at the camera. On the other end, there are several hundred people eager to get removed, get better removed dams. Could you please give them a few encouraging words? <laughs> right. From my perspective, it's a matter of um, improving knowledge. When you can show how devastating a dam can be, that's what makes things happen and you can see a change. At least that's been the case for us here in, in Sweden with our projects. Thank you. And that I will do this silly thing with my finger again. You didn't see it. Okay, back to me then. And thank you from this part. It was Ole Kalles, researcher at Karlstad University involved in this project and, and uh, uh, 
dedicated dam removal in his heart. Well, back to you, Bart. Thank you very much, Asa. And uh, we can hear the machine still on the background. Uh, thanks for seeing something and being witness of, of you being in the field. Um, things are progressing well with the dam. Yeah, it is. And, and uh, uh, next time we'll see and hear from me, I will probably hopefully be in the middle of everything down where you hear machines. I have talked to the guy that promised me to, to let me in and shoot some pictures for you from from the site. Thank you very much, Asa, and uh, speak to you later. Thanks for now. Yep, right. Um, and we're going to stay in, in Sweden. Um, uh, we go to uh, Andrea Lundblad. Um, and Andrea, um, I understand uh, that you actually devoted your whole company actually to their removal. And I heard that for your um, wedding day, you actually got a special machine to remove them. So is, is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. I have a picture in, in it in my presentation, so you, you will see it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, um, please take us uh, through your experiences and the open rivers in, in the Skagen region. Uh, it would be great to, to learn something about your insights and uh, your passion. Okay, I will try to share my screen so that you can see it. Can you see uh, the presentation now. Oh no, I can't hear you. Yes, it's coming up. Yeah. yeah. So, um, my name is Andrea. Thank you very much for listening and inviting me to this webinar. Um, my husband and I, we own a small company that tries to make the world a little bit better for the aquatic fauna. It all started when Frederick was a child, he spent almost all his time in rivers and creeks, fishing and thinking. When he got older, he started to understand that things that we humans had done long before to survive, such as the construction of dams and weirs, canalization and the removal of boulders, stones and fallen trees, now was taking the toll of all the species that lives in free running water. Um, so, when he became an adult, he thought that the restoration of the rivers in Sweden went too slowly. Um, so he decided to go and buy his first excavator with almost no experience at all uh, and started to hunt for his first restoration job. And to make a long story short, he got his first little job and it was an, a success. And with hard work, we have slowly built up a company with several excavators, two trucks, three loaders and two dumpers and we are about in season five to seven employees who work for us. And recently what Bart talked about we have made a big investment and this machine were done for our wedding day. So currently it's being transported from Italy to Sweden. Uh, it's a machine that are normally used to climb in um, uh, the Alps and do jobs there but we want it to work in the water so when it comes to Sweden we are going to rebuild it a bit so that it will be safe to walk, uh, work in the waters and today we have a framework with the county of administrative board in Skåne and we collaborate with an amazing biologist Mikael Svensson who helps us with the follow-ups and uh, the electrofishing and when we have to work with the wet and fresh water mollusks, among others. We have some missions and values, of course. The main part is that we want the fundings to go for action or execution. Sometimes very much of the fundings goes, they end before we come to the actual work. So we want it to be as little as possible, but still, of course, we need to do something. We need to do some research before, but, but our values or mission is that most of the money should go to the actual work. And another thing is we need to act and we need to act now. And we want it to be a voluntary agreement with the landowners. So we really try to please them. Um, 
we work in two ways. The most common is that Frederick and I, uh, often hinted by the administrative board, we identify suitable projects. Uh, then we write the restoration propos proposals. We contact the landowner. And if they agree, we do the work with our own equipment. That's one way. The other way is like here in Maria Berg, where we come in at the ending or almost at the ending. So someone else has done the project proposal and we do the work. Uh, I will talk about two small projects, the smaller projects that we have done. Um, um, the first one is Skogsdala. It's um, two obstacles really. The one downstream to the left in the picture, it's um, passable for jumping species in high flows, but otherwise it's definitive. Uh, the river or the creek goes through this obstacle and through a dam and up to the next one uh, that you see left in the picture. There there is a fish ladder with quite high steps. So what kind of problems do we see here in this little project? The big thing is that it's culture environment. We have an old mill standing almost next to the fish ladder and actually the fish ladder supports the old mill. If we take down the fish ladder, we have the risk that the old mill will cave into the river and we will have a big problem. And if we take down the fish ladder, we still have the obstacle downstreams. Uh, and we also have um, property downstreams that we doesn't want to flood. So what did we do? Uh, yeah, here you can see the property. This is the, the downstream obstacle, obstacle where the leaking dam is. And here you see we don't want to flood his property. So what did we do? We did a bypass. So we opened up a little hole in the, in the concrete to the right of the fish ladder and made a new stream who we um, yeah, dug out. So maybe you can see there is a hole in this part and we didn't make the hole uh, through everything. And you can see to the left in the picture, there is the new creek. And to the right, we have the landowner who of course wanted to keep his dam because he think he has a nice view. So he can keep his dam and the fish can pass and everybody's happy, we hope. Um, here you can see where the guy is standing. No, you can't, but there is a hole here. You have to believe me. So when it comes a high flood, the water, we want it to pass here all the time, but when there is a high flood, it can go both ways and keep the downstream property to being flooded. Sorry, I'm laughing. They are taking pictures of me. Uh, so this is one solution. And uh, the landowner were, were quite, quite happy. Here you see when it has uh, grown up a bit, this is downstream. And project number two, uh, this is called Mjövik. You can practice on the, the earth. Um, it's quite hard to see, but um, it's a quite, it's a, about one meter high weir. Uh, an overflow weir with a salmon or fish ladder in the back area of the picture. Uh, and also the problem in this environment is of course culture again. Uh, we want to save these environments for the generations to come and still make the weir possible for all aquatic fauna, not only jumping species, because the jumping fish can pass. They are the weaker swimmers who who got a problem with this. Another problem is, if you can see, uh, this wall that stands close to the old mill, uh, it has cultural values and it's quite well preserved. And the river or the creek has eroded downstreams. So this is about to fall into uh, the creek. And as I said, we want to preserve it. So what did we do? Yeah, here you see the uh, the side walls on the boats that they want to preserve. So we opened up a bit of the dam. We can't open the hole because if we open all of it, we will have these side caving in. 
and then we build up the creek with gravel and blocks to make a nice stream passage. So in the next pic picture you can see, here you can see actually how high the weir was, about a meter, and it was higher than you can see because we have built up with gravel and blocks and stones uh, the whole uh, river bed. Uh, so it supports this, so it, it stops the erosion or at least make it happen a bit later. So this was all for me. I'm leaving over to you, Bart, again. Thank you very much, Andrea. It was, this is really inspiring to me, just feeling like being part of what you are doing there and finding your solutions. And I guess, you know, this, this how do you deal with cultural heritage and cultural values is something that everybody, you know, in, in their removal um, needs to, to work with. Uh, so, so sharing lessons on this is uh, already a great thing. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. And uh, I can see you're still in the field, right, Andrea? Yeah, I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Excellent, no, good. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, Ruben, um, back to you for a second. Um, um, questions, um, what new questions are coming in on, you know, questions maybe for Ole or for Andrea or for uh, Asa? Uh, yeah, What's thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We have uh, time for a few questions, maybe around three. Um, then we have to get on with a webinar. Uh, one thing to the webinar, it will uh, be made available afterwards. It's being uh, recorded as every other webinar that, um, that we are hosting and you can access it later. So no worries, you can see the slides and all the talks again. Um, I'm also sorry to inform you that we don't have any more time for answering questions about uh, the European session before. So this is exclusively on Sweden. And the one question that is pretty high up in our list is that is for Unipa. Um, and basically it's asking why is Unipa doing this kind of work? Uh, so what's the incentive for Unipa as a hydropower company? Um, and I would like to add that I have read this statement and uh, it's fantastic that Unipa as a hydropower company um, recognizes the ecological value of a free flowing river. So this is something I wasn't prepared to read from, uh, from a hydropower related sector, but this question obviously is still open and uh, maybe some of the people involved can um, can have an idea of why that is. Maybe Asa quickly, but I guess Asa also later on you will dive into this question in even more detail. But maybe um, already, Asa, what can you say about why the dam uh, has to be removed or will be removed? You are mute, Asa. Yep. Yeah, okay, are we live here? Yes. Uh, I have Johan Thielman here from Unifair who could give you a short, short answer on the question. Why are you doing this removal? Well, yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, I was going to come to that a little bit later, but um, uh, we as a hydropower company, we, we promote, of course, renewable and flexible energy, which is the case also here. Uh, so, in case we reduce those benefits for the society, we also want it to be balanced by a big uh, impact on the ecosystem in the river. And in this particular case, we believe that this is the right measure to do because the benefits for the ecosystems are large in the river. That's simply put. Thank you. Yeah, and again, that's, that's good because indeed, uh, thank you already, Johan, and we will see you later on. Yeah, I will dive into the question much more, but this is already a kind of a teaser indeed. Ruben. Yes, uh, so there's another question that is um, not super specific to Sweden, but applies to pretty much every dam removal. Um, and this concerns uh, the existence of any frameworks or programs or models to um, that, that are available to predict uh, um, habitat or sediment erosion after removals of particularly small weirs. So sediment is always a problem when you, uh, when you build or remove them um, in both ways. And how, how do you handle that? Is there, is there an approach for that? Is there a question for Ole? 
Yeah, for Olaf, if he's still available, maybe he has something to say about that. It didn't, it wasn't specified. Um, are you on mute again, Isa? Yes, Isa, please. Yeah. Yep. Hold on. Muted. There we go. Right. So I'm afraid I'm not the right person to answer that question uh, since I'm a biologist. <laughs> I don't do sediments. But I know for a fact that, there is, that in this case, uh, there's been uh, several competent consultants involved in predicting sediment movements and, and, um, and so on. That's pretty much all I can say about that. Thank you very much. Um, and there's one more question for uh, all of the biologists um, that's coming from me personally, if that's okay. And I was just wondering that, uh, or, or even for, for Andrea, but um, so if, is there a case of a dam removal where you have had uh, populations that were landlocked and stopped migrating at some point just because they couldn't and when you removed a where a hydropower dam or whatever, they started to be migratory again? Is that something that you guys have observed at any point? No, I can, can't say. Okay. That I know of any, any such case. Right, okay. Um, and then there's one more question, um, maybe to Andrea. Is there some sort of manual or a handout available uh, that you guys have compiled or drafted in order to uh, disseminate it to other people that are, you know, trying trying the same amazing work that you are doing in other countries and other regions? You know, something they can work with. No, I'm sorry to say that we haven't done any manual like that. Okay. Um, I th yeah. How? <laughs> right. One I think. Question, yeah, I think uh, that's it so far. Um, yeah, maybe there's time for something later, but maybe we could just move on now. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Then keep on uh, asking questions, and uh, Ruben will uh, take care of it. Let's see if we can still squeeze in some time in the end. We have somebody else from the states, Laura Waldman. Uh, welcome. Uh, really good and great to have you. Um, you have been removing more than 100 dams. Um, how, how does it uh, every time again uh, stay uh, exciting for you? Or is it still exciting? You are mute, Laura. Laura, you are mute. Wasn't sure if you want to know. Um, yeah, no, uh, removing a dam is always exciting, Re always exciting. Um, uh, when you can restore a river and its natural processes is pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, I've been lucky enough in my career around restoring rivers and fish passage. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. Laura, we are going to see a pre-recorded uh, interview with you because this is an interview with you in the field uh, where there was no internet connection whatsoever. But you're with us and uh, you're maybe also available for questions. So everybody, if you want to ask questions to Laura, please do. I will pick it, down for, pick it up from there. Yeah, I could definitely answer some of those sediment questions that have come up. And there are a few good guidance documents. Ah, good, good. Um, um, maybe, maybe say say something about it already now um, uh, on, on those two questions, Laura, and then maybe on details later on in the chat. So indeed on the sediment question and the guidance documents, you say there is indeed something available. Yeah, the US Bureau of Reclamation came out with a, a sediment guidance document, for really large dams and some small dams as well. Uh, that has some really good information in it. Um, but I would, and we also have models, we have hydraulic models that do sediment transport as well. Although I would argue that conceptual models are often the best to really start with the dams and not go to the big models. Um, and to do a conceptual model right, you really need good data in the field. You need sediment probes and determine what the equilibrium slope is beneath the impoundment, beneath the impounded sediment. Get that investigation done first, then you'll be much better at predicting what is going to become mobile, what is not going to be mobile, and how the system is going to respond. So I would argue um, really looking at good data and conceptual models is your first step. And then if you need to, you can go to these kind of advanced hydraulic sediment transport models, but I would really recommend that more just for much larger dams in the, you know, 100 feet or so category. 
Thank you very much, Lara. I also saw Jack nodding. He is in agreement very much with that. So everybody, you know, please feel free to uh, ask Laura and Jack and others more questions as we, as we go along. But let's look at the interview with uh, Laura in the field. Bas, can you help us out here? Hey, Bart. Hey, everyone on the webinar. How you doing? Here live in the United States, Eastern United States in Connecticut, and we're out on a dam site. We're out on the Slocum Dam site. Um, it's an old mill dam that's in poor condition, and we're gonna be removing it in another week, maybe, maybe three at most. Um, we've already got our design done. We've got our permits in, and we're just waiting for our permits to come back, and we're going out to bid to get this taken out. Um, I do want to show you this site in particular because we've already dewatered it. So it gives you a really good example of what the impoundment looks like um, post dewatering. And as you can see, the channel is already cutting down into the impoundments. We dewatered this about a year ago. Uh, we are going to remove some of the impounded sediment that's still there and put a floodplain bench in. But you get a real good feel for what the channel is going to look like after removal on this site. Now I'm going to take you down to the face of the dam too so you can get a look at the condition of the dam. Okay, here we are. This is the Slocum Dam. This is a concrete Amberson Dam. It's a buttress type dam. Um, and this one's in very poor condition. If you had a little bit different angle, you could see that it has a lot of concrete spalling, a lot of exposed rebar. It also, like I said, has the low-level outlet open right now, so all the flow is going through. Now, the outlet isn't big enough to let all the flow through all time of year, so actually this ponds up on a regular basis anytime we have higher flows or in the uh, months that have higher flow in general. Uh, this particular dam is primarily being taken out because it's in poor condition. Um, it's not meeting the dam safety codes for the site. So we did a feasibility alt, uh, analysis to start off and looked at the cost between removal or repair. And repair on this dam would have been significant because the dam basically had to be completely rebuilt, rebuilt in order to have uh, meet today's standards. Whereas removal was a lot less expensive but you can see just in general that this old mill site here, it's part of a park setting, has a lot of historic value. So we are going to be leaving the far part of the dam in place, which is the older part of the dam. It's got like timber crib and, and um, you can still see the timber cribbing. And we're going to be taking out this concrete Amberson section of the dam, allowing the river to run free. And there are eel in this river system, so it is going to open up the path to migratory eel, which we've already shown. Um, basically get about this far in the system and can't get above this dam. So that's going to be a, another really good benefit to the removal of this dam. Um, so do you have any questions? Yeah, Lara, so what are the first things you look for at a site? Okay, okay, first things I look for when I come to a site, well, one of the very first things we look at is access and how we're going to get machinery down to the site. On this site, we've got very steep retaining walls all the way downstream. So downstream access would have been challenging without taking the retaining wall away and then rebuilding it. Um, so instead, we have an access route going up to the upper part of the impoundment. We're going to be doing a ramp down through there. And since the site is dewatered, we're going to be doing all of our work in the impoundment first, creating that floodplain shelf, and then start removing the dam from the upstream side for this particular dam. Uh, let's see, so that would be the first thing, access. Then we also, of course, assess condition of the dam and what its current uses are. This one didn't serve a current use other than just as the recreational pond that was uh, had to be dewatered anyway for safety reasons. Um, and then, let's see, the two biggest issues that we always assess when we go out to a dam removal site are sediment and infrastructure. So from a sediment point of view, what we want to look at is the quantity of the sediment, the quality of the sediment, and the mobility of the sediment. Basically, we're trying to determine if we can allow passive transport of the sediment downstream. Are there any impacts downstream, ecologically or flooding-wise, 
that we'd have a problem if we allowed the sediment to go downstream, or do we need to take the sediment off-site or, or even another location on-site? And it depends a lot on the quality of the sediment as to what we do on this site. We're going to be relocating sediment, a portion of it, uh, on-site. Um, and then, let's see, otherwise we also look at uh, regulatory resources like wetlands. Um, we look at threatened and endangered species and historic issues for this site because of its historic nature. We've already done a historic assessment ahead of time. So, do you have uh, another question for me? Yeah, Laura, thanks. So, what are some of the unexpected things that have come up while we're Unexpected, moving okay, unexpected things. Unexpected things, well, a lot of unexpected things happen on dam sites. Um, it's interesting, of course, often we don't even have plans for the original dams. So even understanding what's inside the dam can be, um, can be a mystery. Uh, we have dams that look like solid concrete dams, and then all of a sudden inside we'll get a huge sheet pile wall that goes eight foot underneath the dam. And while we're trying to take out the dam, and we're trying to take out the full sill of the dam, that can be really complicated then to all of a sudden have to take out sheet pile that might be a hundred years old, you know, been there 70 years or something like that. So uh, we also deal with all different kinds of reinforcing issues. We find old um, uh, railroad ties as reinforcing in dams. We find dams underneath dams, legacy dams, either right underneath the dam, just upstream of the dam, or submerged within the impoundment. Um, we have found pipes that we didn't know about. We always do research ahead of time for pipes but sometimes that's all not documented. So sometimes we're in the middle of a dam removal and we'll uncover a pipe. Normally it's not an active pipe, but if it is an active pipe, that, that's a really unfortunate thing to find out in the middle of a dam removal. We have found uh, ice harvesting equipment because they used to use ponds a lot for ice harvesting. We found cannonballs, we found cars, we found a bag of credit cards once with some bricks in it. Someone was trying to get rid of the evidence. And sadly, once we even found um, uh, uh, a dead body. So that was kind of scary. That wasn't during the removal. That was during our investigation uh, for the removal. Uh, do you have another question for me? Yeah, so last question. Do you have any tips for us? Tips, yeah, tips. OK, so dam removal tips. Um, one thing that's important to remember with dam removal is that concrete, if you're working with a concrete dam, concrete cured underwater. Uh, can sometimes be very strong. There was one very large concrete dam we were taking out, and the contractor really underestimated the amount of time needed to remove the dam just because it was so hard to break up the concrete because it was so strong. Uh, other tips, I really like to use um, swamp mats. They can be either steel or timber mats that you use, um, especially if access to the impoundment area is difficult and the, the sediments are very moist and it's hard to get around uh, if they're unconsolidated. We use these mats to put down to help get the equipment out to spots that we don't either have an access road to or that are just challenging places to get to. Um, other things, um, I like to do my projects in the wet if I can uh, and limit the amount of water controls. This helps to get in, into the site and out of the site quickly, and I feel like sometimes excessive water controls have a, a bigger impact than a lot of the other things we're doing, especially if we can get in and out quickly. So I prefer to do removals during low flow scenarios in the wet and have a contingency to get out, get all the equipment out of the water if we get a rain event. Um, another tip, well, speaking of rain events, uh, you never know when working on a river when you're going to have a high flow, a hurricane's going to come through, or a large rainstorm. So you always have to be prepared for that. I really believe in writing good technical specifications that talk about how much water is too much water and what kind of emergency precautions you need to take to get out and get equipment out of the way um, or get your water controls or anything else you're doing out of the way that might blow downstream. You really should always be designing a dam removal um, at any time to have a high flow event um, and be able to survive that high flow event. So keep that in mind and write good technical specifications. Um, other tips, let's see, uh, turbidity curtains don't work very well. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. So take care guys. Bye-bye.
Thank you very much. It was really nice to see Laura. And thank you. It was great. Um, and um, I will not ever forget legacy dams and dead bodies be below dams. So that's <laughs> uh, <laughs> that will stay. Thanks. I see also questions um, continuing coming also for you, Laura. So maybe you can have a look and see if there are things you can answer. Maybe in the question and answer box will be really nice. Um, I'm getting nervous about the Maria Burke um, dam. And Asa, uh, is everything still okay? And um, can you let us uh, talk us through the last half hour because we're getting close? And um, I understand you're going to introduce us to a couple of other people. Uh, Johan Tilburg, yeah, we, Tilburg, we just saw uh, from the hydropower company, but um, I understand we're also going to talk get back to Ole. So over to you, Asa. Thank you, Bart, and welcome back here to Sweden. Uh, things are progressing very well. I, sp I spoke to the contractor and they are in schedule and in just some minutes or more or less than half an hour I will take a walk from my position up to where you hear the sound and we will follow the last minutes of, of removal as planned. But now I will do the silly thing with my finger and I will switch the camera over to that view and let Ole have the microphone. Okay, thank you. So we're back at the soon to be former Maria Berg Dam. And uh, I'm standing here with uh, three very important people when it comes to river, river restoration in general in Sweden and in uh, River Mörum Zone in particular. So maybe we should start by you introducing yourselves briefly to the participants. Yeah. Uh, Chris Terborg, uh, I am uh, Secretary General in uh, Elvredana, which in English is uh, River Savers Association. Uh, Johan Tillman, I'm uh, the Environmental Manager for uh, the hydropower within Uniper in Sweden. We also own this power plant, or former power plant. And my name is Ida Marie Gohl. I'm the Site Manager for Mörums Kronolaksfiske, which is a part of Tvia Skog, which is owned by the Swedish state. Right, so taking into account the different organizations that you represent, one would also expect that you have rather different perspectives on, on dam removals. So you, well, you already got the question why you're removing this plant, but maybe you can elaborate on that, say something more about it. Yeah, uh, well, rep representing a hydropower company, it's of course, uh, we want to promote renewable and flexible energy from hydropower as, most as, as much as possible. Uh, but also we have to accept sometimes that uh, reducing these benefits can be motivated from an ecological point of view. Uh, so there is always a balance and a trade-off between those different things. And in this particular case we see that this rather drastic measure is motivated by the benefits for the ecology in the river. And why is that? Is, is this plant located in a very strategic place or? Uh, it's the first from the sea, uh, uh, and it's the smallest one that we own in the river. We have three other power plants that are bigger upstream, where we have carried out other measures before. So by doing this, we both strengthen the other measures upstream, uh, and that's one of the reasons. Uh, another is that we have a long history of collaboration with our partners like Kronlaksvisket and the local county board here. Uh, and we have had a trustful collaboration for many years, which makes everything much easier. Okay, so Ida Maria, as a representative for the angling community, mm -hmm. one would expect that all the anglers are super happy about the removal. Is that correct? Well, most of them are, true. They've been looking forward to this for, for quite some time now. For a few years, they've been longing for this. Uh, we're actually standing about 10 kilometers from Morum. And we have fishing stretchers downstream and upstream. So this is in the middle and in the way. So yes, they've been looking forward to it. But uh, uh, of course, there's been a lot of questions around it. Right, so um, that's for the anglers. Well, what about the other local residents and, and landowners along this river stretch, Johan? What, what has been their reaction? Well, I think uh, you can find different reactions to this. Uh, some people close to the dam are a little bit concerned of what will happen afterwards. Uh, so they have been involved in the process at an early stage. Uh, some of them 
that um, risk a negative impact on their on their real estate, for instance, have been compensated economically for that. Uh, and I hope everything everybody are happy in the end when they see the restored river here. But still, I, I would assume that there are some common fears when it comes to dam removal. Krista, you have been involved in multiple similar projects in other parts of Sweden. Yeah, but yes, and, and uh, there is always a lot of people when you take that down, the, down a dam, it's always some people that are afraid of, for instance, water supply shortage or uh, that the river will be kind of like a muddy ditch or something, but that's wrong. I haven't seen any case of that. So instead, you have a living river with, with the sounds of the living water and with fish that has been there for decades or in some instance, perhaps uh, centuries. So, so by talking to them and inform, I think informal, inform them in good time. So it's just not come as a surprise, then it's okay. So that's your more, most important advice then yeah, when it comes to I always communication. Say when, when people talk about taking down a dam, uh, hire an artist that can do a, a nice picture a painting, how it will be not the day after, but two, three years after. So they can see, have the picture inside their heads. And there is, uh, when they do that, in most cases, people calm down. So what, what are your expectations? What, what results do you expect or perhaps hope for when it comes to this specific removal? You want, you want, to, want to start? I can start from our point of view. Um, first of all, we, we hope to restore the river to its former conditions before the power plant and um, enhance the habitats that we see coming back now. Uh, that's maybe the most important objective, uh, but also we want to learn from this project. We want to know more about how to carry out this kind of project, uh, but also the response of the ecosystem in future, which is something that involves your university, for instance. Ida Maria? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're just a few kilometers from Morum, uh, a village that is built up around fishing. Uh, and has a long tradition uh, and historical about it. Uh, and that's um, what I'm interested in seeing here. What can the social e economical effects of this be in the future? And last but not least. Yeah, of course, it's, it's uh, good to see a free flowing river with a, a richer biodiversity. That's, of, of course, always uh, a gain, I think. So, yeah. But speaking about fears and migrating fish, what about uh, Invasive species, exotic species, do, do you have any fears that they will um, colonize the river upstream of, of the former dam? Well, the short answer for that is no, since we're done investigating on that. And we don't have any problems with this here. To have in mind is that this river dam has not been totally closed. We had a, a fish pause here earlier. Uh, and uh, for the example, the pink salmon we don't have it here it's on the west coast mm. uh, so no we're not worried about that but in other cases that's actually something you need to consider right so if we talk about Swedish dam removal you want what what is the, the first step so perhaps the first step when it comes to dam removal well as I said you have to involve everybody that are concerned in an early stage uh, the next formal step would be to apply for a license or permit to remove the dam uh, as an owner, you have uh, the right to remove your dam, but you need a permit first. And this permit can be connected with different mm -hmm. conditions for protecting the environment and things like that. So, yeah. Sorry. So what about uh, opposing values such as cultural heritage values? For example, Krista, do, do you think we, we're good at acknowledging that in Sweden? Yeah, yes, I think so, because uh, the, the county government uh, always has to consider that uh, when the, the dam owner applies for, for the dam removal. So it's always taken care of on a rather high level. So, and I don't think it's not, you can always combine them. And of course, no one, no one wants to destroy the cultural heritage. So if you do it with care and think a little bit before you do some uh, things, then you're, there should be no problem, actually. So what about the, this case then? Uh, the, are there any cultural values and have they been acknowledged? Uh, in this particular case, it's not like that. Uh, if so, it might complicate things and make things more expensive and so on. But in this particular case, uh, 
the, the, the dam and the power plant is not representing very high cultural values. Values. Uh, some people have wanted us to save some structures, which is not possible in this case, but mm -hmm. there are always questions about that. Right. River Marumsoan is uh, belongs to a protected area, Na Nature 2000 area. Has mm -hmm. that been an issue in this case? Well, yes. As you said, almost the entire stream is in a protected area and almost every stretches around here is in the Nature 2000, as you mentioned. And always when you have to do something in that kind of area, you need an exception from the rules and regulation. So uh, th that is in mind. But you should also have in mind that um, in a protected area, there's uh, high nature to protect, which also means protect, preserve and improve. So a thing like this can also drive the process. Right. Well, so we can't really see the former reservoir from here, but uh, we saw earlier that the, the levels are low and it looks like they've been low for quite some time. Can, can you say something about how you planned for this? Yeah, that is something you should always consider also when you bring down the surface. We have done, done that for five or six weeks here uh, for different reasons. One is that we want the organisms that might be stranded to follow the water, follow the surface. So they are not stranded or trapped. Uh, another thing is to um, minimize uh, turbidity, turbidity when we lower the, the reservoir. And uh, a third thing is also that we don't want to establish the riverbanks from the uh, when when the water pressure disappears. It might destabilize you know, the riverbanks if we don't do, don't do it in a controlled way. So there are many reasons for that. So what about the question that I got that I couldn't really uh, give a good reply to? Uh, sediment transport. I assume that you have studied this. Who yes, did it and what, yes. what was the conclusion? We did some, did some pre-studies and in this reservoir we don't have much sediment at all. Uh, but I know that that is a tricky thing in, in some other cases. Mm. But we don't have to deal with that here at least. But about. What about toxic substances in the sediments? Is yeah. that uh, an issue here? Yeah, no, in this case, it's no problem at all. But uh, it could, of course, be uh, depending where you are in Sweden for a dam removal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also a thing that uh, is mandatory to check in your environmental impact, impact assessment before mm -hmm. you get your permission to take it down. So it could be a problem, not in this case, but you take care of it before you take it down. So. Right, so it looks everything under control, but and the levels were lowered slowly, so fishes should be okay. I mean, they should manage to escape uh, dry land. But what about other organisms like uh, mussels? They are not very fast. No, no, that's correct. The, the dam has been lowering for six weeks, so the fish had time to adjust. But actually, even the the mussels had time to adjust. Uh, the mussels also climbed down by itself. And the ones that didn't climb down by itself, we actually had it very closely monitored by an expert, a mussel expert, that been moving them for hands. The ones that did not have time to move. But it wasn't a problem. The most of them moved by themselves. Right. So uh, back to planning for, for a bit. It's the middle of summer now. Uh, discharge is low. Yes. Again, I assume that's part of the plan. Yeah. It is, uh, for also for a couple of reasons. Uh, doing these kind of, of uh, jobs is much easier during the low flow. And uh, normally we have very low flows in the river during summer. But it's also a matter of, of reducing the impact on, on uh, species living in the river. Uh, early in the spring, for instance, you have newly hatched fry, fish fry, that are very vulnerable. So this is a good, good time of the year to do this. But what if we all of a sudden had heavy rains and got an unseasonal flood? Would yeah. you be able to handle that or? Yeah, of course we have to, uh, um, to, to this working place. Mm. Uh, but also in this case, we have a river with a lot of lakes upstream that can store, river, uh, store water for, for quite some time if we have heavy rains. Mm. So the change of flow is not that quick here in this river, actually. So well, we've been listening to the demolition work for a couple of hours now, getting a bit tired from it. But what, what about habitat restoration? Will you just remove the concrete slabs and leave everything? Or will you manually, so to say, restore the habitat? We'll see in the end how much we have to do. But we were going to focus on, on the closest area to the, to the former dam, because there you have to, need to add substrates 
Uh, most of the habitats upstream are intact, as we can see now when the, when the uh, surface has gone down. Mm -hmm. So we, I don't think we have to do that much. And what is the piece of uh, machinery creating this noise? I mean, I, I've heard about the hydraulic hammer. Yeah, I heard And so that too. it's huge. <laughs> How huge is it? You know? I'm not exactly familiar with that, but I think you have people over there that can answer that question. Right, right, right. So we should probably bring that question to Fredek or Andrea then. Um, well, that's pretty much it for now. Um, ESA is going to take you down to Fredrik, I think, to talk about the hydraulic hammer and other aspects of the demolition work. So, uh, are you good to go, ESA? I am good to go, and I will let you know in on a secret, uh, guys. I just made a switch with my microphones, plugged out some cables and now I'm going to do uh, actually I've learned a thing when, when you shoot with this kind of camera you will walk like a ninja I will have to walk backwards like a ninja to find the car and walk behind it and now I will change the direction because that was not any good okay guys well now it's time to, to take the walk up stream or up to the construction site. I have talked to Frederick, the guy in charge, and he should be in a little moment ready to do some demolition just for us. So let me see. I do my ninja walk and just to, to add to the excitement, I just got a call from my phone saying I have just 20% of power left. I hope I would manage to do the take you down to all this noise and show you construction I will try to get contact with Frederick and he will give me a thumbs up. Please say something. I have to, to make contact with Frederick and see if he wants to say anything. Stop right. And this is what le is left of the hydropower plant here in, in Maria Bay, one of the last concrete pieces. And I'm actually going to take you a little bit down here and I will do this silly thing with my finger and show you uh, the surroundings too. Uh, okay, there you have Murrum, River Murrum downstream, uh, where 10 plus kilo salmon is on the way upstream at the moment. That is the old factory. And here we have the demolition site. And I am actually standing where it will in a few weeks be a river, a restored river, thanks to the cooperation in between 
Juniper and a lot of other companies. Uh, okay, well, we could take a little walk down here too, just to show you where the water is loading. I'm not doing the ninja walk, no. That is why it's... There is one part of the other part of the river is behind the, the con construction. Uh, that is the one part that is left on this side. Bart or anyone, do you have any final questions for us here in Sweden? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isa. It was uh, really great that you took this effort to really give us this feel that we are also part of something really special. Uh, we are also somehow in the field while still uh, looking at what you are doing. This is really great. Um, Isa, the obvious question, when is this last bit going down that we could still see? Yeah. Uh, is it going down today? It is going to, down today. Actually, the, the, the pause at the moment is arranged or forced by us because I wanted Frederick to, to have a short break so I can transmit from here without the, the hammers. We can take a little look at the big, big, big hammer uh, when it's not in work. There, there you have the biggest hammer at the site and that will probably get everything done by the evening. They have permission to work until um, seven o'clock to, tonight. And then they have, because people live in the area and they don't actually appreciate the sound that okay. time of the day. So okay. that will be going down today. Fantastic, Asa. Now do I do the finger thing and I'm back here. Great. Asa, I think, you know, we are, we are very happy. We are very happy that you took all this effort to really take us to the river. And um, we will leave you with uh, finishing off with the last removals, but um, and very much looking forward for the first uh, fish again to swim up the stream and um, see what's happening, how it looks next year. Yeah, I will be back. And thank you for letting us show you this wonderful construction site. Oh, by the way, let's, let's do a little, little thing that wasn't prepared for. Guys, here is the man in charge, Frederick. He would like to say something. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a show that you were putting up. He, he don't hear. I have the, the headphones. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So can okay, you ask, uh, ask him how exciting is it uh, for sorry, him yeah. to take this one down, Asa? Yeah. How exciting is this to take down this dam? Uh, it's very exciting. It's uh, it's a project I've worked for uh, for many years. So it's very exciting to get rid of the dam and, and see the fishes moving forward. Fantastic. Uh, and in, in it is a great honor to get this job for the company so, and but they are doing the best works around here so that's why they got it fantastic Asa, on that bombshell i want to thank you all for um, taking us to the field uh, us being a witness of this and um, we are going back then to finish off this uh, this this webinar and thanks uh, thanks for you and thanks to ola and johan and Ida maria everybody thanks a lot Okay, with that uh, difference, um, still 400 more people uh, still on the, on, on, on the webinar. Uh, I want to thank everybody for participating. Um, I do hope you enjoyed, um, but also look forward to next um, webinars in this series. Um, we plan to do more of these ones. Um, uh, so please stay tuned. As I said, um, and, and also um, Ruben, this is recorded for so if you want to look back, please do. If you want to share with others, please do. Um, and then another thing is that, um, how do we go forward from here? Um, uh, there is, is um, we have been thinking with a, a huge number of people, how to best go forward in Europe on dam removal. And uh, as of today, you can download from the dam removal website, the, the strategy that we do have for dam removal in Europe. Uh, please feel free to have a look and, uh, and give your ideas and thoughts. And of course, you're very, very welcome to participate and to, um, 
to uh, be part of this whole thing because I think, as I said before, um, their removal is all of us. It's um, connecting people um, and that's the way that we can also really uh, make people more excited about these things and, um, and to do more removals in Europe. I want to thank uh, the speakers. Uh, really fantastic that uh, uh, you were here today. Um, again, many of the speakers did also take us to the field. Uh, so it was a very special webinar in that sense. Um, I know it's a huge effort to, to organize all this. So um, I want to thank the entire Dan removal team, um, everybody um, here behind uh, the computers here in the Netherlands, but also there in Sweden. Um, thanks a lot to, to make this happen. Um, and again, you know, all oh, please feel part of this bigger movement that we have here in Europe. Um, finally, on that bombshell, uh, there is something really exciting to finish this off. It was not in the program, uh, but uh, this is an, um, a, an, um, a look ahead. And um, uh, I want to introduce uh, Francisco Campos. He uh, is a filmmaker and uh, he also got uh, interested in their removal. Francisco, how are you there? Hey, how's it going? Greetings from DC, Washington, DC. Uh, uh, Francisco, why, why are you interested in dam removal? What happened? Uh, well, I grew up in, in, the in the north of Patagonia area in Chile, and we have what I usually call very, with a lot of pride, the most beautiful rivers in the world. You know, so I grew up around rivers and I've been very wired to protect them. So in my country, Unfortunately, there is no such a thing of dam removal. So I saw myself every time fighting dams to be built, you know, and when I started living in the U.S. many years ago, I learned that, you know what, dam removal can actually exist, right? So that wired me again to really think about, okay, so let's try to switch a thing, you know, uh, filmmakers or activists in the third world cannot really succeed against uh, dams, but being built but then removal is more like a viable option so that's why i got pretty excited about it and the last few years everything got even better when i when i met herman vanningen and the whole thing started to come into place right right and i understand you're making a film you're putting together a film and Correct. I think you're, you're interested um i hope you enjoyed the webinar but i understand you're also interested to see more their removals yeah we isn't it yeah, we're working on a film. Uh, you will guys see uh, the first teaser now. Of course, you know, COVID-19 is keeping us a little bit not busy right now filming. So we use this time to release the film material, right? But the film is intended to feature what we call the river heroes around the world. So it's a journey that follows Pau. You know, you guys know Pau. You know, as a scientist going in every single continent featuring a story about a river basin and hopefully then removal, right? So we have probably 20, 30% already shot in the can. And this is highly appealing to me so I can see more people and feel free to contact me if you have a good, a good story, I would love to hear it. We still have a lot of time to put more stories and, and feature things that are gonna be inspired, you know? So what we just witnessed with this fellow in ESA in Sweden, I think that's what we're looking for, you know? Everyone was very excited and, and, and responding positively to that. So I'm all ears, so tell me stories so we can keep going. Fantastic. That's a very good uh, summary. Uh, stories, share stories. You want to capture them. So everybody, you know, if you have stories, share them, share them on the website. Bring Go it, to bring Francisco. It. We'll, we'll find each other. And on that note, I want to thank everybody again. I'm looking forward to, to meet you all again. It was really exciting for me too. Really nice. I can see people from Iraq to Algeria to the US to Colombia, everybody was here. So it's really nice. And uh, we're going to watch your final trailer. And on that bombshell, I would say goodbye and see you next time. Thank you very much all. Has pensado que pasó? ¿Has pensado qué pasaría si bloqueas las venas de tu cuerpo? ¿Te darías cuenta de que no podrías vivir mucho tiempo? Es lo mismo que pasa con el gran organismo que es este planeta. No podemos seguir bloqueando sus ríos. ¿Qué hacemos con los miles de presas, azudes, cruces de caminos y otras barreras que ya no sirven para nada? ¿Las explotamos estilo Hollywood? Sí, algunas sí, claro, otras no. 
pero a la larga es lo mismo. El río fluye y la vida fluye. Mi nombre es Pau, tal cual. Ni Paola, ni Paula, solo Pau. Soy ingeniera forestal especializada en restauración de ecosistemas y más en concreto en diseño de escalas para peces y demolición de presas. Trabajo para World Fish Migration Foundation como coordinadora del Día Mundial de la Migración de los Peces. Cuando estuve hace unos años en Estados Unidos con mi mentora Laura Wildman, aprendí que esto existía, que podíamos demoler los obstáculos de los ríos y mi vida cambió. Conocí gente en todo el mundo que también se planteaba la misma pregunta. ¿Cómo recuperamos los ríos? Y bueno, ya somos muchos. a héroes luchando por los ríos en todo el mundo, a todas horas. Y muchas represas desapareciendo, devolviendo la vida a los ríos. Y ahora en que estoy, me encuentro en un viaje alrededor del mundo para conocer estos héroes de los ríos y poder contarte su historia. Creo que empezaré a llamarles los cazadores de represas. <risa>